من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ما كان على النبي من حرج فيما فرض الله له سنة الله في الذين خلوا من قبل وكان أمر الله قدرا مقدورا الذين يبلغون رسالات الله ويخشون الذين يبلغون رسالات الله ويخشون يخشونه ولا يخشون أحدا إلا الله وكفى بالله حسيبا ما كان على النبي من حرج فيما فرض الله له سنة الله في الذين خلوا من قبل وكان أمر الله قدرا مقدورا الذين يبلغون رسالات الله ويخشونه ولا يخشون أحدا إلا الله وكفى بالله حسيبا وكفى بالله حسيبا ما كان محمد أبا من رجالكم ولكن رسول الله ولكن رسول الله وخاتما نبي 
to welcome you all once again to our uh, now fourth installment of our Sacred Door project series. Of course, we have Dr. Zaini, who uh, is here uh, with us today, who participated in our second installment. And uh, this is our uh, last one of this academic term. Inshallah, we hope to sort of build off of that uh, into next academic term, with obviously the month of Ramadan and the end of the school term coming to an end, Inshallah. So please do continue to participate in these moving forward in the fall, inshallah. What exactly is the Sacred Door Project and what is it that we're seeking to do? Again, for those of you who have been to some of our conversations in the past, you're familiar with that, I, as I've been mentioning, and as uh, we recognize that there is a pretty significant gap in our communities in terms of um, access to um, a little bit access to really increase, what we're seeking to do is creating another access point to, toward increasing religious literacy in our community. Most of that which we engage uh, on a day-to-day -day basis uh, is particularly regarding a lot of ritual and um, a lot of community building. And the idea is to create sort of a more holistic approach such that um, individuals, folks, students from a very young age also see access toward uh, that which is founded within the academy as well. And so we seek toward continuing conversations like these ones with that intention. Um, and speaking of that, next Saturday, which is not this upcoming Saturday, the following Saturday, March 18th, inshallah, we um, are hosting a first of uh, what we're hoping is an annual conference, um, also towards supporting the same initiative, which is to increase literacy within our community, where we are uh, encouraging um, yeah. an age demographic of high school students through graduate students to come out to a full day's worth of conference where we have the opportunity to focus on the theme of knowing and loving God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, so much again of what it is that we do in our communities often void of the sense of God consciousness. And so the idea is to again cultivate sort of a deeper relationship with our faith uh, that goes beyond ritual, but where we are able to emphasize uh, a knowledge and an understanding and a ma'rafa of what it is that we are doing. So we are looking forward to seeing you all there as well. And you'll be seeing a lot of email communication regarding, um, regarding this as well. In addition to, um, though our lecture series is coming to an end this evening for the course of this academic year, uh, we have been uh, creating a lot of multimedia engagement uh, under the same 
brand with the same initiative toward increasing, again, religious literacy, you can go ahead and take a look and follow our YouTube page for an upcoming short clip to be released every Thursday, uh, five, six minutes long, um, on, on YouTube at Sacred, at Sacred Door. If we have some time, maybe at the end of the program, we will um, take a quick glimpse as, as at what it is that we will have already created, but I don't want to take too much time from our uh, guest this evening, Dr. Hassan Abbas. Uh, we'll be uh, sharing some, uh, we'll be sharing his talk uh, titled Revenge of Adi, Lessons uh, for Contemporary Times. Dr. Hassan Abbas, of course, is uh, well known um, in the community uh, due to uh, a great deal of his efforts and a lot of his academic work, most famously in 2020 had um, his work published with the Prophet's Heir. Um, and actually, funny story, I don't know, Dr. Abbas, if you remember, the first time that I had met you, I, uh, we were on a panel together at Umma, and um, you had made a point that I um, arrogantly started to argue with you on the point. That you <laughs> and instead of um, like slamming me and destroying me, and he had absolutely the right to do so, based on my sort of youthful exuberance and arrogance, <laughs> he gave me his business card and he said, why don't you contact me after the program? And I'm happy to explain my position in case you misunderstood me. <laughs> and I took him up on that offer and I sent him an email. And we ended up having an email exchange. And, uh, uh, and you have no idea how much that one moment meant to me and what was a really formative period for me. So with that, that got us. Thank you. and honored to be among you. Uh, and honestly, I, I totally forgot about that conversation. <laughs> But uh, what I remember is um, uh, listening to many of your talks and you have been not only very articulate but very um, always intelligent and wise and um, I've just while coming here, the conversation I was having with a couple of uh, young students here where they, they were telling me how you have inspired the younger generation and I'm really uh, proud to be calling myself your friend. The plan was um, to spend about 30 minutes or so with you and Ideally, to have a kind of a conversation, um, to interact with each other, and to go to this journey, which I am not claiming I'm the one who will trigger this, but I'm sure it is um, a question that all of us think about. How to think of our religious traditions and the principles in, in terms of or in, in reference to our contemporary day-to-day -day life, the big questions of the life, our careers, our future, our goals, our uh, options for the job, our activism, uh, <clears throat> also our positions on so many important international issues. Uh, because many a times we keep religion boxed into either linked to some dates or to certain rituals or to certain debates. And we spend so much time discussing, debating, arguing in those historical elements of the faith and that leaves very little time for us to ponder about what our religion really means for today. That's why when Sheikh Fayaz um, very kindly asked what should be the focus, um, what are my ideas on what, how should we frame it, I said maybe reimagining a for contemporary times and I know it is ambitious but but that's the plan and I all I want to do is to raise some issues and then get into a conversation uh, hopefully within 25 to 30 minutes when I conclude my initial remarks we eat something because I thought that's the best way to have the best uh, Q&A afterwards rather than keeping you away from food and myself also uh, so <clears throat> first thanks um, uh, sincere thank you to the community I see many faces many learned scholars uh, Dr. Hussain, Dr. Shaila Dr. Noor and many of you are here, some of my students are also here who I uh, recognize immediately, Sadaf and some others. Um, and uh, so this is uh, means a lot to me and I, to those of you who follow and, and um, these religious teachings and follow the scholarship may not find anything new, but the purpose is to engage and for me also to learn. So let me start first and foremost by saying um, that I, I see a lot of um, energy, passion, because it's a young crowd, so this, this energy, this passion, uh, this hope um, on, on your face, I mean, that, that, that inspires me. And I hope to draw from that and to, to speculate as well. 
I'll go in my introduction to some of the basic facts for those of you uh, who are, might be relatively new to the ideas of Ali ibn Abi Talib and for others, so, so I'll go through some of the basics but I'll just quickly go through those and then come to about five major points which I think we need to think about increasingly. While I was looking at the, the name of the organization or this initiative, the Sacred Door, um, I immediately thought of um, framing it. What I want to do today is, what, what, what I mean by reimagining it is to open the sacred door a bit wider. And the reason we need a wider door is linked to the idea of this contemporary times. Why we need to reimagine it? First, so there are two questions I want to clarify right up front. Uh, why to reimagine? Really, what is the need? And, and why Ali also? Why can't we reimagine uh, a religious discourse through some other lens? So that's very important. Why Ali is one of those sources or the source or one of the most important sources? That has to be clarified. And then the contemporary times. What are the challenges of the contemporary times? Um, and, and then I'll go into those five points that I really want to share with you. Um, why the need for reimagination? The tragedy of religious discourse today is that sectarianism, divisiveness, and putting religion into certain boxes that I am religion, religious because of the way that I pray or the days that I pray or, 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 or some of the rituals that I'm aligned with or associated with um, and the debates that are so central in the religious discourse, that, that requires the need for reimagining it. Because we, are, in my humble view, uh, have not been able to <clears throat> either fully comprehend the legacy of Ali or really benefit from the central features of Islamic discourse. Islamic discourse, which is at one level radical, which is always supposed to be inspirational, uh, which is always there to guide in terms of principles. Rather than that, the debates, and it's entirely possible that I have been watching too many of YouTube channels lately, but there, there are so many very interesting ones. Those of you from South Asia, if you um, uh, follow uh, this, this this young scholar by the name of Muhammad Ali Mirza, please raise your hand if you have heard of this name before. Very few, two or three, four. Okay, uh, so I need to explain why uh, I took this name. This is a young Muslim scholar who has challenged all the major religious groups, including Shia, Sunni, Wahhabi, Salaf. And he became, he has become so popular that as soon as he delivers a lecture, um, by the evening it is, uh, the views are into at times, tens of thousands always, but in, into hundreds of thousands as well. And his slogan is, um, neither I am a Sunni, nor I am a Shia, nor I am a Salafi, nor I am a Sufi, and uh, this is the real Islam. And he sits with Sahai Sirta, the main central uh, group, uh, books of the Sunni Han. Uh, the point I'm making, and he has been challenged, by so many people, that's one. There's another person. He's Muhammad Ali Mirza is also controversial, but there's another part these days. I had a chance to watch Hassan Alai Ali. Many people have huge issues with him. California Shia scholar. How many of you follow or know Hassan Alai? Relatively more. Very interesting. Very controversial in certain areas, but very very knowledgeable on, on the Sunni sources. The point I'm making again here is uh, this is just just a symbol or just, just a reflection of a little reflection of what I am referring to. The debates within uh, religious discourse, religious domain have become so controversial. Controversial people with, from different communities only meet and argue or discuss and debate and follow religion in their own small groups. And that's why the larger galvanizing force of Islam in terms of its inspiration as a spiritual uh, movement um, at times it feels it, there is something missing. That's why reimagination, reimagining of certain personalities uh, is important. That's why I, I picked the word reimagine. That's that the, to fill in that gap, to overcome that division, whether that is sectarian or political or for any other reason, uh, cre creating a divisive, uh, divisiveness. Second question, why Ali? And for that, again, if I have to just pick five things, I would argue. Um, 
um, starting from the times when the Prophet Muhammad used to go to the cave of Hira. This is actually, I've heard very little of this even in the uh, in the Ayurved tradition also from scholars. There were two people who were mostly going with him, maybe Khadija, his wife and Hazrat Ali as a kid. Um, from that to the famous play, famous event of Dawat al where the Prophet for the first time is making a case to everyone, to all his cousins and all his family members and saying who will support and Ali as a child stands up and Prophet says, um, okay, he here is a person who is my successor, my buddy. This is again mentioned as in the core text from there to the battlefields and from there to three of the most important things and references. Why Why I think, why is Ali important? Why, why be imagining Ali is a, is a, is an important frame? Uh, whether it is Mubahira, which is again mentioned in the Quran, there is hardly any debate on who was the personality who was called the Nafs of the Prophet. I I'll encourage you, if you are hearing or not many times about these verses, um, this, is, this is worth looking into and thinking about this, irrespective of which tradition you come from. Uh, why is Prophet calling the, the Ahlul Bayt in, the, in the ground of uh, mobile and calling Ali his nafs and what that means by it. Has, is there anyone else who claimed that no, it is about me and I was there? No one else has claimed uh, to be the nafs of the Prophet. Or the most famous of the hadiths when Prophet is saying Ali is to me or to Aaron was to Moses. Well, what is meant by that? Who's ask actually any Jewish tradition, even today, uh, you, you go to a synagogue and ask uh, the Jewish community, they often what would happen is. Uh, like we we had we had heard this beautiful recitation in a Jewish tradition. If you are in the synagogue, they will at times ask you the first for the person to recite. They'll say, "Anyone from the family of Aaron? Whether if you are a scholar, you have a special preference. Even to this day, those who belong from the, the family tree of Aaron uh, in the Jewish tradition has a very very important role. So there is, and historically also, we you know what Aaron was to to Moses." Prophet saying that, um, and in so many places, and such an um, authentic, credible hadith, it, it has implications. And last but not the least, the Prophet saying which, which the highest number of and I, scholars I hear, Sheikh will correct me also, uh, to the best of my knowledge, one of those hadiths which has the highest number of uh, Sahabi and Rasul who, who have quoted it. There are others which have been quoted by different people in different layers, but in one generation of the Prophet's companions, who uh, reference to uh, uh, to the day of Khadir and this famous statement Man kuntu mawla, paaza, ali, mawla, is a very famous one. It was towards the end, it has huge implications in terms of the spiritual air of the Prophet, in terms of the legacy of the Prophet. That's why Ali, again most, for most of you this is basics, uh, but at times it is important to realize and remember. And, and another the famous verse from Surah Al-Maida where the reference is to Nama Waliyukum, again famous known to many of us, but God's clearly saying um, uh, your helper and supporter uh, and Wali is God, is the Prophet and those who pay zakat while going down. This is again, no one else has claimed to the best of my knowledge in any mainstream historical reference, uh, except it was well known that this was about as uh, Ali al -Hassan. That's why Ali. So keeping just as a background, as an introduction, I, you know all this, but I'm just at the work or uh, um, I, I wanted to start with this. That's why Ali. It's, it's not a random choice. It is not a choice that you can make by comparing people because there was no one else you could compare with Ali. And no one challenged among those who we believe had challenged among each, uh, uh, among uh, themselves. No one had claimed that in spiritual uh, worldview, even the companions um, who were his, uh, Imam Ali's com contemporaries and there were debates and discussions, even no one among them had claimed to the best of my knowledge and I um, can, can debate with someone uh, who ever said, oh, I know more than Ali. Everyone said, no, no, no. Let's, whenever there's a crisis, challenge, go to Ali. There was a reason for that. And again, now moving forward, I was trying to find a good definition of when you say, in, I'm saying the words in Urdu, but I'll explain the Ali Bada or um, the, those who follow Ali or Ali Bada. What do we really mean by that? The word, the history of the word Shia and how, how relevant and central or important that is. And if I found a definition which is from a scholar who some people think uh, controversial, but I, I consider myself a student in his fan. I've never met him. Uh, but if you, there's a new book that has come out by Professor Hussain Mudarasi in Princeton University. 
on text and interpretation on Imam Jafar Sadiq An absolutely amazing book. Um, uh, lately, when I was reading it, I'm more than halfway through and my family members realized I'm every day sitting, reading a book for a short while and leaving and some, one of my daughters asked, so uh, is there something very special? You're marking it like three times. It seems you're spending most of the time reading it and only you're halfway through and I said, no, I'm enjoying it so much. It feels like I'm sitting in my humble way in the company of the Imam because their original Arabic sources and some of the interpretations are so powerful and so unique and if I, I highly encourage you to read this book, this is published by Harvard University Press very recently but some of the themes that come out which are linked to this idea of reimagining Ali is the idea of rationality, common sense, some of the basic deductions which are straight away which allows you to think that okay this, this deduction makes so much sense this is not being thrown at me that this is divine injunction and that is it the door is closed whenever people would approach Hazrat Imam Jafar Sadiq one he would always quote from his father um, and grandfather and going always to for everything he said to reference to the prophet and that's why relevant it's relevant to Ali as well Ali is important as a reflection of the prophet whatever Ali ibn Abi Talib was telling was our most authentic, credible, real source to what the Prophet meant and Prophet wanted. Because Islam is nothing but, but the way that the Prophet had explained it to us. So Ali is nothing separate than the Prophet. Ali is anything but the reflection of the Prophet. That's why we consider that uh, as an important source. And I found a definition of the followers of Ali which to me, it, 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 it may not fit into any specific tradition of Ashri or Ismaili or Zaidi or Sunni or Hanafi or Maliki or Deobandi or Barelvi, but I found it to be so fascinating, very simple and straightforward. Sandra Dharasi says, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit only, uh, the followers of Ali, or the lovers of Ali are those who follow the opinion of Ali when reports from the Prophet are contradictory. And the ones who claim who they are Shia, they are the ones who, for whom the opinion of Jafar bin Muhammad al Sadiq is important when they when there is there are contradictions from the reports of Ali. Very simple and but very very uh, insightful. That th th those who claim to be followers of Al Bayt, their first source to always go to is what the Prophet had said. If there is a contradiction apparently, which is possible because there were so many reports from different people, people interpreted it the way they wanted or mistakenly, then just see how, what Ali did. Because that is the most authentic reflection of what Prophet actually wanted to say. That's why Ali, that's why uh, reinterpreting, if I may say reinterpreting, then that has more um, theological meanings as well. So I, I will um, say that I, I would better use the word which is in the title, which is reimagining rather than reinterpretation. Um, so reimagining at least that's why it is, it, it is extremely important. Now let me go straight to, in, in two lines, about the contemporary challenge of which contemporary world I'm talking about. And again, I can give you figures, but uh, uh, globally, um, this is the era of inequality. This is an era of uh, injustice. All you need to do is actually go on social media, just switch on uh, Bernie Sanders, um, some short co quote and you will find the figures. Um, um, how many 5 or 10% of the people control 90% of the wealth and etc. These are well known accessible facts. But the, the fact which stares us in the face is inequality, injustice, the, the migration, demographic moves. I mean, we, we just read this uh, such a painful story of uh, what happened in Italy. The number of people who died, there was, I was reading a story of a Hazara a Shia Pakistani girl from Quetta who was representing Pakistan in uh, the national hockey team. She had a future uh, and she was doing so well. And she was on that boat as well because she wanted to run away from there because of the threats to her life and her community. And that's the problem. Path she opted and she died in that um, a, a tragic incident near Italy. Uh, what I'm saying is there's so many people across the world I get a chance to travel, um, people who are always uh, thinking about moving from where they are because the inequality and injustice is so stark in their face. That's a contemporary challenge. The other contemporary challenge of thinking, I don't 
sound want to sound too much on an inter, as in a preaching reference, but um, it is so obvious the the element or the criterion of success today is revolves around the amount of money and your greed, whether it is political, social, or economic. That that element of competition, the element, the criterion of success depends on uh, on on wealth, on on the hard core of this money. And I was thinking of this famous quote, uh, famous hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who said that in uh, the types of risk that comes from God, the lowest quality is what we call money. This is the lowest when you you pray, God, I need to give me more risk. Actually, the, the risk is intellectual, it, it is your capacity to help others, it is your capacity to pray, do so many things that you want to do. Money, how much money you have, that's the lowest form of risk. But, but that's how many people you think would be even open to uh, considering this, even, even among ourselves. These are the contemporary challenges. On everything, do we really need to think about what is, uh, uh, I'm thinking of a word that I recently read by, by Farah Pandit, there's a book called How We Win, she was a speaker in one of my classes uh, very recently, and she is one of the chapters called Halalization. And I said, Farah, what do you mean by halalization? <laughs> she said, my meaning is that everything we have forced ourselves to think about halal or haram, it is not like that. There are certain larger principles. Uh, the door is very open. We have restricted the door because we want to be controlling who walks inside the door. It is not meant to be like that. And that's why a reimagining Ali is extremely important. But five points. I have about 15 more minutes to conclude and I'll take two or three minutes on each of these things. Uh, first and foremost, so why, if I have to reimagine Ali, what we often think of in religious gatherings is uh, people will recite some of the battles. Uh, on, Ali's name always it comes starting with the battle, which is extremely important. But in my reading, in my study, in my humble understanding, if I have to, to I am no one to grade, but I am saying for our understanding purposes, the first and foremost criterion of Ali and his, his reflection was through his selflessness. Selflessness. I will tell you a little story on that, what I exactly mean by that selflessness. Um, while working on my book, which thanks to friends and people like you, uh, the Prophet said, which got a lot of recognition now, it's, uh, been it's Persian edition has come out, Arabic is coming soon, and Urdu also uh, coming soon. Um, I was looking for different um, resources from different traditions because I wanted to write it um, presenting um, Ali as a bridge as a unifier, which I'm really convinced he was, uh, irrespective of anyone's religious in inclination. Um, and I was looking for different sources from what poets had said, what philosophers had said, what scholars had said, what people from Sufism or Irfan had said. And I found one story which stunned me and I realized um, I had never heard this before and I claim, can claim I uh, listened to scholars from both the Shia and Sunni tradition, South Asia, UK where I studied in the US also for the last 23 years. And then I researched why, why that story is not as popular as how it should be and how central it is. It's a short, um, uh, this is from actually a scholar who is the chief of police in Pakistan. His name was Fazli Haka, writer also. First, I'll very briefly tell you a story about him. Um, he, as I mentioned, he was a soldier, a police chief. Um, uh, he was a poet also. And he writes this in his book. There's a sh short book called uh, Masnavi Mawla Ali which has, a, I think, hardly a handful of copies left in market for, for, for the reasons of bigotry and sectarianism. And luckily I have, thanks to his son, a copy. Um, he says in his book, he starts by saying um, that um, he uh, went to uh, for Umrah and then went to Medina. And he promised the Prophet وسلم, in front of his shrine, he said, I am a poet. I will write your biography for, for my beloved Prophet um, through Poetry. So, in, in the shape of verse, he said, I came back to Pakistan, this is about 1960s, and he said, So I said, Okay, this is the big project now. I'll write the biography prophet in, in poetry. And he said, All of a sudden, I realized my capacity to write poetry was taken away from me. He said, I, said, I struggled and struggled and struggled for two, three years. And he said, I didn't realize what happened. I said, He, he said, in his book, he said, I'm so ashamed to myself. I made a commitment to the Prophet. And now I can't start even writing. 
He then saw a dream was is through some channel, which is a different subject, but he, he let's say for the purpose of clarity, he saw a dream in which he was conveyed the message. He writes and told that you want to write the biography of the prophet, but remember the prophet had said Anamadina Til Elme Bali and Baba. First you have to write the biography of Ali through poetry, then you come to that's how he, why he wrote, and he was from the Sunni Hanafi tradition. That's why he wrote uh, the Masnavi Maulad. In that book, he writes in his introduction the story which actually I wanted to share with you. He says that uh, it, it is in, mentioned in many books from S and not true hadith that uh, the day the Prophet returned from um, a Miraj, which we just celebrated, commemorated on the 27th Rajiv when he returned from Miraj, meeting God. He called his four friends according to this tradition. He called his four best friends. And now the tradition is not mentioning any names. He said the first, he asked to the first friend, um, so I have brought from above, from God, a harkai fakr. And by he the translation of that is, which I found the best one is, a cloak of transcendence. Kharkai Fakr. Fakr from Fakiri, those of you who understand the Urdu Persian language. He said, the, the Prophet said to his friend, four friends, I've got Kharkai Fakr. God has given me this reward. And I want to actually share with one of you, but there's this test that all four of you have to go through. So then I'll give, whosoever gives me the best answer. And the answer question was simple. The Prophet said, Tell me if I give you this cloak of transcendence, Kharkai Fakr. Then how will you make best use of it? Because it will give you special spiritual powers. The first companion said, Oh Prophet, I will use it um, to have more money and I'll give a lot of charity. Second friend, okay, what will you do? He said, I will actually go around the world, I'll proselytize. And I'll take the message of Islam. Okay. The third one said, I will establish the systems, the foundations of the uh, justice system. I will ensure justice prevails. Then the traditions, tradition is not naming the first three people. The fourth one is named. So then came the choice of uh, uh, the option of for Hazrat Ali. Ali, what will you do with this Kharkai Fakr? And Ali gave a very strange, by worldly standards, a very different answer. Ali said, I will use the power of this Kharkai Fakr for concealing other people's faults. And that was, comes so surprising. So who, who are the people who conceal others' faults? Normally everyone wants to make best use of the opportunity for whatever reasons. It is an element of selflessness. That's how I would portray it. That, that's why I was making the case, uh, reimagining Ali first by becoming selfless. Second is by, and I know the time so I'll quickly go through the second and, and third and then go to my two real points I want to emphasize. So selflessness is first, um, in, in a political sense also, and that, that Ali showed through his life as well. The second one is of standing firm against oppression. And that Ali made very clear during especially his battles against uh, Moabia and Yabi Sofia. Those battles were very clear and the letters of Ali and the communication with Mahabi Abne Sufyan is very clearly mentioned in Najibla. I highly encourage um, uh, to, to read those because it was a pushback against authoritarian. It was a pushback against oppression. It was a pushback against the violation of the fundamental principles of Islam. That was the second reason why I think in a contemporary sense um, that pushback on authoritarianism in any of its shapes and forms, whether you call it elements of modern colonialism or imperialism or oppression of any sort. So howsoever you frame it, that's your heart tells you often. Um, political correctness is, is one thing, but your heart tells you when you see some a wrong to be done, standing up for that in the best way possible is the second principle which, which I wanted to emphasize. The third one is, and that's again, um, like most of you, my, my reading of Nejil Balala tells me, um, at every other page you find the reference about the poor and the orphans and the destitute. 
It seems as if the whole um, set, whole model of governance, which comes um, from largely from the letter to Malik Esther, is so too much pro poor. Whether it is in front of a judge, um, it is about the rights of the people, or in front of the tax uh, commissioner. I'm using the modern word, but that that's what uh, the, the document talks about so clearly. Whether it is the leader, it is always tilted in favor of the poor. It seems as if the whole purpose of religion was to give those who have nothing or who have been wronged. That is the impression I get from it. I encourage you to read it. And this, this of course, was everything, as I said, is the reflection of the prophet. That's what um, why reimagining um, religious religion in that sense is extremely important. But now come, let me come to two points which I want to emphasize. This far, I think. Things that I've mentioned, maybe in a certain sequence, but these are well known to you. But I'm close with two aspects. One is, if from my own uh, academic worldviews point of view, I'm often thinking, what is the role of a soul, of a scholar and a writer? If I have to learn for contemporary times, what if today I was sitting with Ali Ibn Abi Talib and asking him questions about? I'm a humble writer, I'm, a, I'm an aspiring scholar. What is the guideline for me? And I found five or six very powerful um, quotes and which, which are reflective of his overall teachings which I want to share. And then if there's time, um, also what Ali would have said to people um, who are, which, which are all of us. We go through uh, distress, through at times depression, through at times uh, because of the challenges of life. And at that moment, it seems that, okay, religion is often, it should be of solace and it should be of value, but we often uh, uh, think in terms of hopelessness. What is the answer for contemporary times? What is the Ali's response to that? Uh, but first on education, and most likely I will be able to do, uh, I can't do justice uh, in any case, but um, I can use the remaining time only on one issue, the role of a scholar. Um, it is very clear, um, and this is I'm quoting, um, I'll be looking at my notes because I want to be specific, because this to me, um, even as someone who had read Mamali's works uh, often, but every time I read it, it in, not only inspires me, it surprises me as well, because it's very, very modern in its state. Um, Mamali had said, knowledge is a criterion of personal distinction. A person is worth what he excels at. That it's knowledge which is the, the most important criterion or qualification. Deep thinking, Mahali said, presents clear picture for every problem. And the number of times I found emphasis on the study of history, I was mean, how many of you are studying history majors or interested in history? Many. Not as many as I wanted to see, but many of you. Uh, and now some specific quotes. Uh, the one which really, uh, this is from uh, Tahira Kutputin's book, um, and she's actually recently I made a comment in one of my talks, um, I think somewhere in Baghdad, where I was actually trying to shame some of the most uh, wealthy Shias that, um, do you know that Najul Balagha is not translated in English in a way that it, should, it deserves to be by a native English speaker? We have two or three translations which are very good, uh, but, but it's a tragedy that Najul Balagha is not in. And then one of the uh, students there who were uh, representing a group, they said to me, they said, Tahira Kutuddin is doing that. She's not a native English speaker, but her, her knowledge and her access to um, uh, resources is, is great. There are other people as well. But the quote, this is a, a quote from, from her work, which is not, not in Najib Balaga. But as you know, Najib Balaga is a selection. The, the, large, the references, uh, the scholarship, uh, the teachings, the sermons of Imam Ali are um, more than uh, anyone else. Actually, all, all that you can collect in terms of speeches and sermons from, I would even claim, pick any 50 companions of the Prophet and get all their scholarship or speeches, what history tells us on one side, and you'll find Ali's work not only higher in quality, but in, in, in quantity as well. So it was there must be a reason why uh, Ali's work were kept. So she quotes, uh, Mawari had said, the learned man is like a date palm. You can expect a date to drop on you at any moment. A learned man is worthier than one who fasts, prays, and fights in the path of God. Another one, Mawari said in Najarala, knowledge and practice must go hand in hand. This is very insightful. Knowledge and practice must go hand in hand. 
Whoever is knowledgeable must act. Knowledge calls upon action. If answered, it will remain, but otherwise it will disappear. So anyone who is not acting on the knowledge, the knowledge is going to go away. The Imam said, scholars live forever. They disappear only in physical image, but in hearts and minds of people, their memories and messages are entrenched. I have not seen any other field in which Mahdi had said so much and such profound thoughts. Then he says, he who acts without knowledge is like the one who is directionless. Another point, and this is again linked to the idea of knowledge. Imam said, there is no benefit in recitation without contemplation. There is no benefit in just recitation, my emphasis, without contemplation. And there is no benefit in worship without comprehension. How many of the people who just wrote learn some of the prayers? Keep on repeating. These are very important days and months. And I'm sure uh, many of all of you here, uh, you read the translation as well. Because that's what leads to comprehension and contemplation. Um, I think I've taken enough time and I'll close now uh, with one element of uh, a small section of Imali's speech, um, which, which helped me in a great way to reimagine. Although it's, it feels as if, and that's the sign of a great scholarship in some statements, when you hear it, it feels so natural. It feels so much common sense. If you feel as if you already knew this, this was in your heart. That's the feeling I get from what the passage, and this is the passage, one of the most authentic, which are the final words of Imam. Part of this was in uh, his uh, speech to, or will to his son, Imam Hassan, but others have mentioned it. There's, I was able to collect this for my previous work, and I'll, I'll take the honor to recite it, uh, to read it, and then just, just I'll throw it. That's how I think uh, reimagination of Ali is important. He said, do not, we, this answers partly the issue of what happens to us in this world when we go through challenges, uh, depression, um, directionlessness. He says, do not weep for anything that is taken away from you. Speak the truth, show compassion for the orphans, succor those who are anxious. Those who are anxious around you, you have responsibility, my words. Hold, now Imam says, hold fast to the robe of God and avoid this call. I heard Abul Qasim says, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Imam Ali is quoting him, I heard Abul Qasim saying, the renewal of unity is better than all your prayers and fasting. The renewal of unity, add the words you want to do, within the Shia, the Isna, the Ismaili, the Zaidi, among the larger community, the Shia and Sunni, everyone. Uh, the renewal of unity is better than all your prayers and fasting. Fear God with regard to those who have a right to your protection and hospitality. Fear God with regard to the protection granted by your Prophet and do not Allow the Dhimmi, who were the Dhimmis at that time, non-Muslims, Jews and Christians. Do not allow the Dhimmi to be oppressed among you. Finally, he's dying his final words. How few were the Jews and Christians at that time? You must, in his last words were, you must pursue harmony and generosity and avoid infighting, friction and fragmentation. I entrust you to God and bid you farewell. These were Imam's last words. I think absolutely clear. And when you see the contemporary times, most of the things we do are exactly opposite for this. That's why reimagining Ali through selflessness, through help for the others, support those who are anxious, stand for justice, be clear and become knowledgeable. It's a responsibility for everyone, not for only scholars. That's how I will conclude. Emphasis on justice, standing against oppression, that's how we need to be measured. Thank you so much. One time we did a book talk during COVID. I don't know if you remember when, when your book first got published. And I asked you this question, and um, I recommended your book to uh, many, many of my students since then. And one common question that would always come up uh, by many uh, who I had recommended the book to without them reading it is um, why did why did the author use such a polemical title for his uh, for the title of his book called the prophet's heir 
Uh, so I ask you maybe to answer that question. Why did you choose that title? And doesn't that stoke up the polemics that you uh, would speak against uh, uh, later on as you emphasize unity and the, and the uniqueness of ideas as a source of bringing people together? Thank you so much um, also for listening to my submissions. And this is a question, incidentally, I also get quite often. And, and also get mostly from people who have not yet read the book. Uh, because if they read the book, the answer is there. Uh, but the question is extremely important. And there's a little anecdote, and then there's a, a kind of a more uh, thoughtful question, the thoughtful <laughs> response in a sense that that, that is an, an afterthought. Uh, the real reason was when I wrote the the work, um, the purpose was to bring people together, but um, I had picked a title, simple and straight, The Life and Times of Ali Ibn Abi That's what I said to the publisher. And, uh, and I'm grateful to the publisher because I'll tell you how, how difficult it was to get the book published. Because one, I'm a, scholar, I'm a political scientist, I'm not trained as a religious scholar. Uh, Islamic studies was never my subject. So uh, for an academic publisher, that too, of standard of Yale, I mean, they, they needed some credentials. Um, and so it went through two stages of peer review processes. Because in one case, somebody, a professor actually in this town, and not mention the university, uh, they, not, not this one, uh, <laughs> they, they wrote in peer review process, they said, oh, the person is calling that Najul Balaga is one of the sources, Najul Balaga is not a credible source. And I said to my editor, look, this is really very biased. This is the kind of bias I'm talking about. And uh, so, so the, the publisher was very keen and they, my editor uh, and, and their editorial team, in fact, came back to me once they read the manuscript. Uh, and there was this debate of peer review, they went to another peer reviewer and then actually a uh, scholar who ultimately later on, we are, these reviews are normally blind reviews uh, and you're not supposed to know. But in this case, I came to know by chance because the person mentioned to somebody who's a, actually a leading uh, Sunni scholar in Boston at one of the leading universities, uh, who became the strongest supporter of the book. And he convinced as a reviewer that, no, this book must be published. And either he also mentioned this title or my editor said to me, they said, we have picked a topic, uh, a title. And normally as a writer, I know that um, you are totally free to write the book, but the cover page and if any images they use, and there's a debate about image also, uh, they, that's normally the, the uh, kind of um, uh, authority, you can say, or decision um, of the publishers because they ultimately want to make money or get the money back at least that they are invest investing. So my editor said to me, we have picked a topic. I wanted to actually partly be politically correct, partly be straight by saying the life and times of Ali Ibn Abi The editor said we have picked the topic. It's the prophet's heir. I thought for a second. And I said, honestly, probably I wanted to pick a topic, something like that. Partly I was scared, partly I wanted to be politically correct. I'm, I'm telling you the very honest, candid answer. And I said to the editor, so is this some Muslim picked this? Who picked this title? She said, no, I read the book. And I, I'm convinced that Ali is the heir of the Prophet. That's why I'm suggesting it. And she was very, being very honest. And I said, wow, okay, if you're okay with it, I'm okay with it. <laughs> uh, secondly, I knew that this can be this can be uh, slightly controversial. And honestly, at times you have to have a controversial topic to, to, to draw people to it. Uh, I think if the topic was simply the life and times of Ali Ibn Talib, although this was not the purpose, this was not my intention, this came, topic came to me. But then I started deeply thinking more and more about it. And the argument is, and to my and I myself come from, I often tell people, I come from a mixed background, a Shia parent and a Sunni one. And uh, um, um, my wife belongs also to the other sect than mine. And I believe, um, um, although this will take us into a different conversation, but uh, this, this, this division, this airtight division into different sects is very, very problematic to me. Um, because I often feel that the, the, this, uh, the way anyone who thinks they belong to a sect, they are in direct violation of the the quote uh, of, of the Quranic verse, 
بعض اسمه بها بلا جميع ولا تفرق so yes you can say school of jurisprudence I'm absolutely fine to have a, of course the Jafri which I uh, belong to Jafri tradition I would claim or Hanafi tradition each one of these traditions are religious jurisprudence and that's absolutely in order but to be associated with the, the word sect is very very problematic if you think you belong to a sect whatever that sect is named is is problematic the other thing is the prophet's heir so I looked at this in a different sense the word heir go to the dictionary the word air has political meanings. Let's take that first for a second. Um, so, who were the uh, Prophet's political heirs? Abu Bakr, Umar, Usman, and Ali. Is there any doubt? They were the four political political heirs. That's true. No one can deny that. So, Ali was one of the four. So, if I call Ali the political heir, it will not be wrong because he's one of the four. The second meaning of the air is often in a legal sense, and people write in the way. So, it is, there is no dispute in the Islamic history that the reason why Ali was burying the Prophet was because he was the closest relative. Prophet had no son. So that's why the responsibility came to Ali. Who was given the task to distribute all the amanat and any, anything that Prophet owed to somebody? Ali. Was there anyone who ever disputed that? Or who said, no, 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 Mr. X had it. No. The legal heir was Ali. There is no, then the spiritual air, the third meaning can be spiritual air. Ask the, any pick, any Sufi, irrespective of whether they are Shia, Sunni or Wahhabi or Salaf, whatever they call. In the tradition of Sufism and Irfan, ask people uh, what they think, where the Sufi, the mystic tradition goes to. Or, when, when the most famous this, uh, these that I quoted, Man kunto mawla fahaz ali mawla. Either prove me that that is a fake or wrong hadith. Or you'll have to be forced to think about it. And this again, I am forcing you to think beyond your Shia or Sunni lens. So in, in these three definitions, political air, at least Ali, you, have to, you consider him half that that is accurate. In legal air, there's no dispute. In spiritual air, there's no dispute. So out of three criterions in English language, Ali fulfills two and a half. So how the prophet's air is divisive, I don't know. I think it's very, very accurate. If it sounds divisive, it's your own thinking. That's what, and I want, it's not, it, 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 I'm debating it uh, for divisiveness. Um, that is, um, I, I think, proved um, that that was the point. But um, yes, that's, um, most people say this because the, on, on social media, the challenge comes, oh, this is, um, Abu Bakr was the uh, political leader. Yes, that is true. I'm absolutely fine and anyone should be fine. But you see it in the largest sense and the air, some people mistakenly think. In fact, the challenge came up when the book is being translated. So in Iran, the two Persian translations have come. One has translated it as Varis Nabi and uh, the other is Varis uh, Varis Nabi or uh, Varis Pehambar. That Pehambar and Nabi will be the same. I'm forgetting Janashine Nabi. Sorry. Mm -hmm. One book is translated as Janashine Nabi. The other one is Varis Pehambar. And in Urdu, we are still thinking about it. Um, how should be, uh, what should be the uh, Urdu and the, the Arabic one. Um, and one scholar who's done the Arabic translation, he's getting it published from Jordan by Al Bedson Society and Al Sunnah Society, who are absolutely fine with the title. So it's the ordinary people, me included, who immediately think and think, okay, this may is, is a debate on something. In fact, the, the tremendous support I received from the, from the Sunni readers. In, in UAE, in Pakistan, uh, its pirated editions are available everywhere. The one short anecdote, one, and this, this tells you the kind of debates. So the actual picture, the image that the uh, publisher picked up was the one which is also the title of uh, Najib Heather's book on history of Shiism, which is uh, again, which shows the features of the Prophet and Ali as well. And I looked at it and I said to editor, no. Then we purchased this right from, uh, from um, uh, from the um, British Museum, it is not showing any features, but uh, three countries said, this is blasphemous, we are not going to import the book because Ali is shown. When I said, is there anyone where I'm saying this is Ali? This is a picture, somebody is sitting, Ali was never sitting on a throne. This is a depiction of Scala sitting, no features. And to many people's surprise, we mentioned that this is some of you, and again, I would like you to raise your hand if you're watching. Any one of you watching Arturo or have you watched Arturo, the Turkish drama? <laughs> raise your hand. Okay, good, many of you. So this painter, the, uh, the title, the image 
was painted by the official painter of that Kai tribe under the Ottomans. So this is very much part and parcel of the Sunni tradition. So in Pakistan, when the country, in one case, one of the countries which not banned it, but they stopped it, uh, it's in port. Uh, the local publishers have done the pirated edition and I'm happy because I should not say, say it publicly, rather than $25, it is available for 600 rupees, which is like very cheap. So I want more people to read it. So even when somebody is sitting on a place where they thought they will control, the market decided they want to read it. Uh, and so far, I have not received many people ask me, is there any hate mail? Actually, none, I should say. The only challenge is uh, this one, but what you have rightly mentioned, um, the profits here, why, why this title? But but that's uh, what it is. Sorry for a long answer, but I thought mm -hmm. there's a story is linked to it. I'll, I'll, so I'll, I'll hate that. <laughs> 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 Anything else? I'm sure your ideas as well. I mean, honestly, the purpose was that uh, this reimagining Ali, uh, when you think of Ali or you think of a role model, because I often feel we are really missing the role models. We, we think of old historical figures that are role models and we think they were a different society, they were a different era. So that's why we even don't say it publicly, but we feel that there is no direct model which tells us how to live the life today uh, because we don't want to go even to that point where we are able to say okay what is the deduction what is the principles keeping aside the rituals the, the ritual also irrespective of in which tradition you are because most of your passion emotion is taken away by the ritual very less time left for contemplation for introspection for thinking because you feel, uh, even uh, let's say prayer, I mean, you, you're praying and you're praying hard and you're doing pilgrimage and, and you feel, okay, I have done my way. I, that's the religious box, I've ticked it. So it is not forcing us to think in our lives because often we think, okay, maybe this will be so complicated and so intricate um, that I'll get boxed and I'll get stuck Why I'm performing such and such role which religion wants me to do or not. We have not made religion um, into this, this something which constantly inspires us, which constantly gives us answers. Uh, because we, we never reach the point where we can read something, a religious text um, in, in detail. I mean, I remember myself, and this is my accepting my own mistake, many are prayers on some very important occasions. Those in Arabic, my Arabic is very poor, and I thought there's no time for translation, it would be a big deal, the 15th of Shabbat, Ramadan, if I even just read it. And I can't make any sense of it. And I realized, I went to some scholars saying, okay, is it okay? I just read the translation. And I learned there is such a heated debate among the scholars. Those who say you can read the Arabic and translation or just the translation. Why not just the translation? So I might be violating some main Ayatollah's or religious scholars edict. But what I'm saying is that at times, uh, common sense is so uncommon which then take, keeps us so much away from the principles of religion. But any thoughts are welcome. I mean, or what do you think about this? Or what, what, any other thoughts or questions? I'm more than happy to share my humble ideas. You are going to give us five points that you left. <laughs> that is, that's a good point. Those are kind of longer. One was on, uh, like I picked the one on the idea of uh, scholar. The other one, I mean, the only two roles where Zali has spent a lot of time in his speeches. The other one is uh, the role of a judge, actually, which surprises me. How central is that? And um, how detailed and extensive that is. In a letter to Malika Rashida, for example, this whole notion of what Montesco had taught us, and we take credit and claim, rightly say that our the American system, in fact, is built on this idea of separation of powers between executive and legislature, legislature and judiciary. Um, Alipya Vitanip said so categorically and so clearly in letter to Malika Lashtar that it is uh, the, the, the judge is not supposed to be under the executive authority. It is so clear uh, 1400 years ago. Um, and the role, for example, of, of within that role of judiciary of the kind of tax commissioner, that the tax com the word commissioner I am using, but it's it, the word Arabic is also exactly for for tax. 
uh, things like don't go and knock on the door of the person you are taking the text from invite them to a third place mm -hmm. if you ask a person it is such details you will feel as if you are reading a modern manual of the text in a democratic country that go um, and ask when you ask for a text and the person says i don't owe text accept that person or that if there is a, a a judge who has called people listening um, keep the uh, i'm using the police word but that's what actually meant those guards and animals out of the room so that there is no pressure of the poor it is so insightful you can exactly translate into modern constitutions uh, but in muslim countries and it is it is important to think it is not by accident that this letter to malik al ashtar or these ideals are not trans transmitted or transported into our modern discourse because in most muslim countries the kind of authoritarianism is so entrenched the message doesn't suit anyone it's not that the people are not religious and they don't know one is a sectarian bias in fact malik al ashtar why and i ask this to many scholars uh, my dear friends in the sunni community there is one scholar who is a very good uh, friend and a leading scholar who wrote a book on good governance and i asked him i said so mr so and so how come you missed even a one line reference to malik al ashtar you have wrote a whole book on good governance in islamic tradition you you made an extra effort to leave out this reference to malik al ashtar and then the conversation it turned out later on that of course in the sunni tradition many people wrongly not it's not in the mainstream sunni thinking but many of those who are biased they say that malik al ashtar the one of the closest friends of ali was involved in the murder of uh, the third caliph hazrat usman which is not true at all according to the sunni mainstream history but some salafi wahabi whatever you call them they believe that that's why people said oh malik al ashtar that's toxic name uh, we will not get forgetting that it's not something directly related to malik al ashtar he was the governor who was designated as governor to egypt he could could never even reach because he was killed through poison on the way it was hazrat ali's letter telling the governors in this case named to malik al ashtar that this is how you should govern but people in certain references just sidelined the whole letter to malik al ashtar because they said oh we don't like malik al ashtar so we are not even ready to leave. read what ali said it's not malik al ashtar who's writing that but think of of of, of the barriers and these barriers and the same in many cases i forgot to mention the quote that i had shared with you of uh, this mehraj and where the prophet saying okay uh, when ali said i will conceal other people's fates and the prophet said okay probably i never finished the story i should have or maybe i assume that you understood when ali said i will conceal other people's faults the prophet said khalkai fakir is for you so when i asked many shia scholars why this beautiful story which actually suits ali if you are a shia why it is not in the shia books and people normally look the other way and then somebody said because they the sunnis have added this fourth thing saying meaning that the first three are the three caliphs because if you start quoting it you you are accepting that these are the four closest Uh, friends of Ali, I said, sir, you are ready to give up such a beautiful story in favor of Ali because you just cannot accept that the other three close companions in this case were seen as the first three caliphs. So the biases are everywhere. I'm not throwing one sect under the bus. Everyone needs to be thrown under the bus. In fact, <laughs> uh, the, the way what has happened to the religious discourse, uh, tragically. I mean, those who are divisive. I mean, I'm not saying those who want to bring people together. I often give this example. Uh, of, of NYU, truly. I mean, the the combination of um, Imam Khalidif and Sheikh Fayaz, it's such a beautiful combination. And uh, the more there are such combinations where people from different traditions together, I, I know both of the these leaders are helping each other's community in a big way. I wish, I mean, uh, we can collect all the money that we can add and build this into a stronger, stronger, bigger program. Please tell them I didn't tell you that. <laughs> So, so because there are very few such examples, and that's the tragedy. Uh, and if I may, one and a more anecdote. When I moved to US, as I said, I had my parents from both traditions, Chen Sunni, my wife from a Sunni uh, Bareilly tradition, and when we were in Boston, 
we uh, we decided our girls uh, alhamdulillah have three daughters and we started we said initially initially the plans are always very ambitious um, <laughs> and you knew you had said okay we we'll go go to sunni mosque we we'll go to a shia mosque we we'll followed that for some time um, and we realized that the shia community that we are meeting and the sunni community we are meeting they were not meeting each other in the same town a very educated people and that was kind of really except one or two people who in social gatherings would invite people from the others and i said what a tragedy that's why the the the, the, the message of ali in terms of uh, bringing people together in fact in the final passages i quoted as uh, professor muqtadir khan who who writes beautifully that if we are claiming and he is from the sunni tradition claiming that ali brings to us closer to god through dua kamels through other prayers why is ali not bringing the shi and sunni together if ali's narrative is so powerful which is bringing you close to god it should be able to bring shi and sunni closer to each other as well it should have the same power why is that missing no i don't have the exact answer but but accept this that because somehow we don't find time to think of the commonalities and that's why we need to reimagine it that's why sorry i'm going on and on no any other thoughts any other ideas share any story please or share any thoughts so if you think this is the wrong framing i'm absolutely open to it and ready to reframe also i was thinking of some uh, poetry the there, there is a reason why that kind and again i'm not drawing comparison necessarily between ali and somebody else Uh, but the poetry whether it is in urdu or persian language there, there was such some charisma and some mystique and and mystical attraction to the name of ali and to what he said which is unparalleled and i continue to think why is that so um pick any poetry from in urdu from me there to ghalib uh, many of them were shia uh, by some orientation ghalib was never a born shia uh, but you read his poetry you will be stunned in urdu in persian as well the qawwali and the other traditions why there was this kind of attraction um and part of this again my tentative answer and i'm looking for answer and share please share with us on what why you think and Dr. Hussain and Dr. Shella love to hear your thing because none of us has uh, seen Ali in that sense uh, for so many in the Bareilly and Sufi tradition as well. I often when I hear uh, the Sufis and the mystics and people in the world of Irfan, irrespective of their sectarian identity, they they love for Ali. There is no comparison uh, com- for any other personality without getting into the sectarian debt. And why is that so? one answer that comes to my mind and i'm still thinking tentatively is that why people think in fact based on so many clear evidences that um it was at least political right to get the leadership at that time but because he so gracefully and that's important to emphasize never let tension allow to convert into a civil war it could have been the case that those people who claim that he would have opted for a civil war if he had more people i am not ready to buy that at this time um i have not seen enough evidence and i know this this might violate some disbelief in some of the very important tradition in the snashri but but i think it was intentional because of the idea of selflessness the political power goal i'm not saying there was not a challenge or dispute ali was very clear that it was his right and ali very clearly explained it also in various conversations um, uh, with uh, the first caliph hazrat abu bakr as well um, he had invited him to his home um, at one point and he had a very clear debate and discussion but in a apparently very respectful fashion and he challenged caliph over abu bakr at that time and caliph said abu bakr said well um, because i was uh, the caliph should be the one who closest to the prophet and he said to him you know that's not you know who was the closest and the sunni hadith tells us that uh, uh, tears started flowing from and uh, the eyes of abu bakr this is main sahi sitta main ha- most authentic sunni hadith sunni scholars all mention it and that was it the discussion ali was not into taunting a debate or discussion 
uh, it, if it was so central uh, to the continuation of religious belief, now I'm going in a dangerous zone, but if it was so central, he would have fought. But he never fought, not that he was giving up his claim. Maybe because people realize about his selflessness, that's why there's this love for Ali. Or what else? Why? Uh, this special for the poets and songs and, and the mystical dimensions. Why is Ali so central? That my tentative answer is because he was seen as somebody whose right was taken away. So there's always sympathy for those. Is That is one reason. But I'm, I would like to know I mean, what the scholars think of, uh, uh, what can be the other. I, mean, I know this is a debate outside the realm of the main jurisprudence or main um, uh, theological debates. But to me, that's a big question. Why Ali? Because you, you look for Rumi. Rumi had said about other uh, personalities and companions as well. But, but again, the, the constant tragedy is some of the other companions. Uh, the, the, the whole message, for example, of Abu Zarqafari is so profound. Many people think he was the actual father of communism and Marxism. I mean, we were talking about uh, uh, the Communist Manifesto with Dr. Shala briefly on, for something else. And um, I thought if you read uh, the life of Abu Zarqafari and read his story, and that was one of the main stories I picked up for my book as well, so central. He was so powerful. Komeyat, uh, for example, or, or Malik al um, And you will not find the stories of these companions who were the closest companions of the Prophet also. They were not Ali's friends only. They were Ali's friends because they were very close to the Prophet. And I say this to my Sunni brothers and friends. These, why don't you mention the stories of these four companions? Only because once you start talking about them, you will you'll figure out that on most critical moments in Saqifah and elsewhere, they sided with Ali. So you want to just discredit them right from the word go? What a big loss. Same what she has doing many a times. Many of the companions uh, who had very important roles to play. Just because in a divide, because look at what Ali did. When he became the Caliph, what was the first thing he did? He said, all the special benefits will go away. But then what he said also, he, there was no political polarization or there was no nepotism. It was not that he said, okay, who are those six people or ten people who stood by me at the time of Sakifa? They will have, they will be appointed as the governors. No. He was totally, it was based on merit. People that he picked, some many, many important people, for example, as a Salman Farsi, who whenever I go to uh, Iraq and check, always they say, no, no, Salman Muhammad. And I said, look, there's another Farsi. He was Salman Farsi. Just because he was from Persia, you can't just take away the word Farsi from his name. Um, but this happens with due respect to my Arab friends. But Salman Farsi as well. He was governor of Madain. Under whom? The second and third caliph. So if and Salman Farsi was the closest friend of Ali on the family of Alul Bayt. Um, so if there was a real challenge, Ali would have stopped them. Malik al was also the leader of uh, second caliph Umar's uh, major force. Was it Ali that Ali stopped somebody that no, 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 they are my political opponents, you are not going to help them. No, there was no such thing. That's a why when he was in the dying moments, when Ali is quoting the Prophet, that's what when I, the last speech I quoted, I think that's so central. It's not reimagination, it is a reminder in fact. The imagination is something in a different sense, but I'm forced to say reimagination because we are so much out of touch with that. Please. Uh, has it really not asserting the right uh, by force, which all of us believe he would have won without any effort? And uh, the people who have seen him fight probably also believe that. It would have established forever that might is right, whoever is the most powerful person, whichever country has the most bonds, they are going to move. So he has to. He had to not show that. He had to show that you have to be, when you're powerful, you still you know, so true. step back for the sake of the humanity and, and uh, decency and unity. So true. I know, absolutely. But I often also think, I mean, building on the excellent point you're making, that the, how useful it is, for example, and this I've seen. Uh, uh, I'll give you another example, a short story building on this point. This was one of my first major book events and um, it was a major Sunni mosque in California. So some 
if you watch some of my YouTube previous events, you'll see here these stories again and again. But I think these are so powerful and instructive. So every time, I, anywhere I go, I share these. Sorry if this is a repetition for some of you. So this is uh, the, the Imam. This was a major Sunni mosque in California. The Imam of the mosque, who's actually somebody later on said to me, oh, "You're going to the Brotherhood guys." I said, "I love Brotherhood guys. What's wrong with that?" And they said, "Oh, so the Imam called and said, so we have 1,100 people signed up. Um, they'll not show up 1,100. But we are expecting 500 people. Six. So, so Dr. Hassan, uh, please be careful." Say, what do you mean by careful? Uh, he said, you know, I said, no, I knew what he was saying. I said, no, no, but tell me, please, uh, what do you think I should not touch? He said, no, no, no sectarianism. I said, that's, I've written the book exactly for the purpose that it's, it should defeat sectarianism. Um, so don't worry. So now the next day the event starts. It was at the peak of, uh, the book had come out in March 2021. So it was at the peak of uh, uh, COVID. So it was Zoom event. It actually, it were, I think, five or six hundred people online. And the, the Imam introduces me. It's available on YouTube. He says, Hassan Abbas, <clears throat> um, this, this is the author. He writes like a Sunni and he thinks like a Sunni. In my heart, I was happy if Sunnis called me Sunni and Shias called me Shia, that's the best deal I can. <laughs> However, I thought, I said, why he said that? So I later I called him. And I said, so Sheikh, I mean, it's, I said the exact same thing. And I said, I'm. Thank you very much. Very kind of you. But you can guess from my name, although you never asked me whether I'm Shia or Sunni, but you can make a guess and that will be right. So why you said that? Is it because of the Sunni pressure on you Why you're calling a person who may be a Shia? He said, no, 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 no. I'm very genuinely upset that. I said, what do you mean? He said, because I read your book. I said, okay, tell me more about it. What do you think is in the book? <laughs> he said, I read the first three chapters and the first three chapters are the biography of the prophet. I said, true, because it's the prophet, I had to introduce the prophet. He said, but you love the prophet so much. It's only the Sunnis who love the prophet so much. <laughs> I said, what, Shay, what do you mean? He said, this, you guys love, uh, Shias love Ali more. I said, no, for God's sake. And this is an imam of a, one of the biggest mosques. And I say it's often to those audiences, which they are mostly Shias, but I'm telling them, okay, there's something really, something serious has gone wrong. Your narrative is seen, they were genuine, they were not, he was not joking. They, some people genuinely think that you put Ali at par with the Prophet, which is not the case. No, any Shia of any words will tell you, no, no, no. But if this is the impression that is going, there's something wrong in your narrative that is creating that impression. So we need to work on it. He was generally thinking uh, and giving me credit for that. And so, so that's, we, we, that's why more forums where Shias and Sunnis together discuss these things. And I had realized after that in many events, there's a very small hurdle where I, and there were two events in Pakistan, selected gatherings, I was a little careful. <laughs> and in the events, uh, the, the bigger threat I received was from a Shia crowd, which was very educated, one close to Islamabad. Again, this Sheikh, you will put it up on live later on? Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, okay, that's fine. Good. <laughs> so there was this uh, event in Islamabad where uh, a Shia crowd, very educated, there were, I think, maybe 150 people. And uh, one person came to me afterwards. I could see that, and this was before the book came out. Actually. I went there, I said, I'll test some of my ideas. And I was testing, and I was careful. And so one senior person comes to me, and he, which I can mention, he was a retired Pakistani army general, a very senior person, a Shia. And he said, Hassan, I'm telling you because I was your father's friend. I was your father's student. He was my father's student. He said, that's why I'm sharing with you. Don't try this in any other Shia center, what you said here. I said, please tell me what? I said, he said, you will not go out alive. I said, this is very serious. What have I said? Now, I, I was curious which of my notions testing was something that was so serious. He said, you said that Ali did the bio of Abu Bakr. Don't say this. That was not true. I said, well, history books, I think he did. Um, and that's the whole point. Um, after six months, he 
Yes, maybe this was not the way in the modern sense we immediately start visualizing things. It was he accepted him, he went to the mosque and uh, the, uh, the other side of worker came to his house. According to Sunni sources, he cried, he apologized and there were serious issues. We are not trying to cover up those very, very serious challenges. Fadak, Bibi Fatima, there are very, very important challenges. Leave that aside for a second. But in this case, things continued. Then Azad Bakr nominated Umar. Um, we have not, there's no sign in any book that Ali stood up and challenged uh, or when, yes, the third time, when, uh, the time of uh, Usman was picked, it was a clear debate and that for anyone with any uh, knowledge, if you, you go through these debates, if there are any Sunnis as well as Shias, please read those debates, what happened when Azad Umar, the second caliph, nominated six people, four, they would debate and they, they were debates which are recorded by history, which are considered authentic, very, very insightful debate. Um, Ali could have received the caliphate at that time because when he was offered that do you accept that after the Prophet and, and the God you will accept uh, the hadith or the, the precedents of the first and second caliph and he said no Ali knew exactly what was happening he could have said yes and he could have got the power he was least interested in power he said no I'm not obliged because he is the Prophet's spiritual heir he's saying I'm not I don't think I'll follow what Bakr Umar said because there's so many instances where at least the second Caliph Umar was always coming to Ali. Um, so why would Ali follow Umar's precedence? Uh, Ali himself uh, was more knowledgeable than as per main sources. The point I'm making: these there are such clarities in, on, on on the first case as well. So that was one Shia incident in the center. Um, also, one of the Sunnis in in one case. Um, uh, people were very surprised. The Sunni, the, the most interesting was from a from an Imam of another Sunni mosque, who wrote to me. Uh, he said that he, I have checked every source and I was not aware of many things you are saying. Uh, and I said, so that's the divisiveness because we restrict ourselves to our domains. So again, I, I know I'm repeating myself, but the points I'm making is uh, th th we need to read each other's histories. And other history that we believe in with a very open mind. I think, did anybody else have a question? I didn't want to jump in, but I think this question about, or this topic that you keep bringing up about history, obviously I'm a historian, so I want to okay. <laughs> emphasize this, but I often, I guess the question is, I think sometimes we view Islam and our religion as a faith and a set of rituals rather than a history that we need to study as well. Um, and I think a lot of times, um, you know, we have a younger generation who's very interested in the community building aspect, right, and the social justice, but often um, we fall short in educating on the actual, like, his history of his early Islam, right? These historical figures, what role they played in each other's. I mean, I have a, a, a friend, a colleague who's a Shia professor at another university who uh, received a complaint from a student for saying in a class that Hazrat Ali sent Imam, Ali, uh, Imam Hassan and Imam Hussain to protect um, Uthman's house, right, when there was an angry mob outside. Um, and those kind of moments are not sort of taught, right, or not talked about because we don't often study um, Islam or Shiism as like as history, right, not just faith, not just belief, not just rituals. Um, and so how do we go about, I think, educating our communities more, not just on sort of these divisions that you talk about, right, or, or theological divisions, but on um, getting people interested in actually the history of Islam. Because I think knowing that, knowing these debates, knowing these instances that you've talked about in your book goes a long way in helping bridge the divides, right? You know, very kind of you. Um, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, using or writing history from people from all sides of the divide, um, using each of the sources and reading the history. And you, I, thank you for reminding. Absolutely, your um, I've seen your work as well. And it's it's. I often feel. I mean, in one area where I'll be a little more critical of the Shia tradition in this regard is uh, the the Sunni historian or the mainstream writings were from the Sunni scholars and purely Sunni version is often called the Islamic history. And she has at times emphasized writing, publishing things by emphasizing the Shia version. 
or the Shia Islam, giving up the claim that this is also one version, this is also as authentic as the others, the number of uh, people who follow uh, uh, is not a criterion and even in case of Ali, in fact actually I think the, we were doing a, a statistical study of, uh, forget about the word Shia and Sunni for a second, but those who believe in that the, the status of al Bayt was higher than anyone else, there is a clear Muslim majority the world over. Those who believe that al Bayt and the Panjitan or the al Bayt because the, the, the statements and hadith are so clear and so many, no one can claim that a number of take 20 companions, very important, respected, honorable companions, and you compare them with al -Bayt, no one has ever claimed, and please correct me if anyone has read anything, who has ever said or any history book or any religious book claims that these 20 or 5 people for that matter were afzal or more important or higher in status than al -Bayt. no one claims. So if you go by the followers of al -Bayt, they, they are a majority actually. So you, you don't go by this 80, 20 or 70, 30 and uh, those divisions. But this happens only when, as you so rightly pointed out, when, when we, uh, we read history and write history um, with, with an open mind. Um, there are so many sources I often feel on each other side which prove the other's case, but those are often ignored. Um, please, go ahead. Well, what I was going to say, uh, on, on the other hand, you did, I think, what you mentioned, that question about a reviewer mentioning that Muhammad al-Talaqa is not an authentic source, okay. is the flip side of this equation, right? Mm -hmm. Which is who has the power to decide what is authentic, um, what is Islamic history, right? Versus like a, a, a sectarian source, right? Or so a problematic true. source. That's that's the other side of this equation. So true. Right? So true. Absolutely true. And I, I was thinking of reading uh, when when the Baitul Ilm or the House of Wisdom, as you say, with during the times of uh, uh, Imam Bakir, Imam Jafar Sadiq in, in Baghdad was happening uh, and later on as well some of the top scholars they used to teach both in the Shia centers and the Sunni ones. I mean this division, that, that division now that you are going to Al-Azhar or you are going to Madrasa so and so and you are going to Najaf or Qom is this demarcated. I think one of the steps will have to be these the people who manage these major centers to, to ensure um, that people from the other faith are also invited as guest speakers or scholars or fellows, if not purely students. I mean, those and one feels it should not be that difficult. Uh, but why is that not been attempted? Even? Or maybe that it is attempted and we don't know, but maybe it's so few who are doing it. Um, the people have to open the door wide from all sides. Um, and rather than criticize. We are being very critical of the. The Shia tradition at this point, and I'm talking to a group which are probably much the next generation to me, and who probably doesn't know much of Urdu. Uh, Urdu speakers have almost always taken pains to quote from Sunni scholars and Sunni history, and as you say, Islamic history is written by Sunni scholars. And in fact, we would an entire lecture by Turabi and everybody else who have followed them has taken pains to always say to authenticate what we believe by the Sunni scholars. So we have never had any trouble reading history written by the Sunni scholars. In fact, we know it way better than they do most of the time. But I have found that people are very resistant to the Sunni community to hear anything said by Shia. People have walked out of rooms and I have I have been asked to speak, um, and they said that we have been told by elders, do not listen because you might something wrong, might go into your ears. And uh, at, at a very, very simple, uh, you know, those um, I said a Muharram meeting in a uh, Sunni school, and they asked me, and uh, by the end of it, you know, like somebody had practically not saved me, like, she is our guest, and please do not be like this. So, and I had not said anything <laughs> in the sense that when you come to the last, she said, well, if everything is the same between the two of us, then why do you call yourself Shia? And I said, there are certain differences because, and I said to her, and this is the land. She just fell down and said, she doesn't believe it, she doesn't know it. And I basically, in Sahai Sutta, six of the books quote this uh, Hadith. 
So she would only listen to the one out of seven who made us a portrait. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I think that we are being uh, Hard. more harsher on Shia than. That's true. That's intentional. The intention <laughs> is uh, because we have more, uh, uh, I'm assuming more Shias, so I'm being harsh, more critical because I want to force you, the young folks, to read and to rethink, not to challenge, uh, but but in terms of thinking about the other side. But that that's in in that sense intention. But the, on the central points, I fully agree with you. Uh, being a minority then had its disadvantages. And uh, there are reasons why in certain areas this happened because of partly ignorance, uh, partly um, emphasis on wrong ignorance. This is this hadith is the, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam saying clearly um, that uh, also that I am leaving behind me two things: Quran and Al Bayt. This is uh, many of many people who have not read it, or the mo mo I would say in some uh, segments the more popular version of this is uh, which is not authenticated except in one place that I am leaving behind you two things Quran and Sunnah whereas the, the real which is quoted everywhere is I am leaving behind me two things Quran and al -Bayt. in fact that this is a very profound hadith because um, if the Prophet is saying and, and there is a further part to it and I am leaving these two uh, till they meet at the Hosea Kosa which has a very specific meaning and this is made from Sunni hadiths and Sunni sources as well. Um, this is again ignorance. How many Sunnis read Sayyid and how many Shias read the four major books of hadith? That is another big challenge. Um, uh, and, and because they are so dependent on, in many countries on scholars who are not that well versed and not very well educated themselves. The, and this brings me to a larger point of degeneration of religious scholarship, um, uh, which, which has had a huge impact. That creates more divisiveness. When people say, "Why, well, I have never heard it." Well, you are no authority that you have not. If you have not heard it, it's not true. So I fully agree with you um, in that sense that uh, people emphasize and they become more arrogant in their ignorance, um, and that is a big challenge. Uh, and in that specific case. Uh, Shias are bigger victims uh, of that ignorance on the other side because those those are these are very very clear. Uh, but the bigger larger question why reimagining Ali is important is is uh, it is harder to bring people together. But that is such a central need uh, because in this process of um, either you call it division or focusing only in one area that some of the biggest treasures are sidelined or ignored and forgotten uh, from within the Islamic religious history. Um, and, and that, that the loss is so huge uh, that people on all sides have to make some compromises by avoiding things that would offend the others. Because the, the whole idea uh, was the even in, the, in your difference of opinion to have that kind of grace and the respect for the other which allows the other to think and study and read um, rather than, than a taught. And scholars like you and many have that grace and that art, uh, but many in the popular squ square, they, they don't have that grace. And then that creates many problems as well. Um, so I think I have made repeatedly my main ideas uh, said. Thank you very much for your time. I don't want to keep everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your audience.